In this video, I'm going to explain how and why individual bases or base pairs can shift their conformation in response to local conditions. I want to get across an idea of the flexibility of the double helical structure, which is a distinct idea from the stability of the double helix in terms of separation of the two strands. Previously, I described the structure of the B-DNA double helix, which was represented in an idealized uniform way in diagrams such as this one. Looking at such diagrams, you might get the idea that all base pairs look more or less the same, and the structure is very regular. As an analogy, I can compare this average B-DNA structure to this image, which some researchers created by blending the faces of many men in their local area, which happened to be in Germany. This face is clearly that of a male, but it does not belong to any one man. It is an average of the features of all the men in the study. Actual male faces deviate from this structure. Here are two examples. These are also male faces, but because of the ways they deviate from the average, they may generate quite different impressions in the viewer. In the same way, DNA structures can deviate from the average structure, which gives each sequence its own individual character, which in turn can influence, for example, how proteins interact with that sequence. When we look at a polynucleotide strand, we can see that there are quite a few bonds around which rotation can occur. The six distinct bonds in the sugar phosphate backbone are designated by the first six letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha through zeta. For example, the bond between this oxygen and the 5' carbon of the deoxyribose is called beta. Because of the constraints of the double helix, there is not complete freedom of rotation around any of these bonds. But some rotation is possible, resulting in flexibility of the backbone. A seventh bond around which rotation can occur is the N-glycosidic bond joining the sugar to the base. This is known as the chi bond. In nucleotides, the base adopts one of two main conformations, syn or anti. Both of these bases are shown in the anti conformation with the rings of the purine or the oxygen of the pyrimidine oriented away from the sugar. In the syn conformation, the base would rotate 180 degrees around the chi bond such that the purine ring or the oxygen would be over top of the sugar. It turns out that this is impossible for pyrimidines to do because of steric clashes with the sugar but purines are able to adopt the syn configuration, as I mentioned in a previous video when I described the structure of Z DNA. But even in B DNA, individual purines can flip to the syn configuration, as shown in the diagram on the right. If the A in an AT base pair shifts from the anti to the syn configuration uh, by rotation around the chi bond, then an alternate pair of hydrogen bonds can form between it and the T. The same thing can happen if the G in a GC base pair goes from anti to syn. The base pairs on the right are called Hoogstein base pairs, and at any given moment in a B-DNA double helix, a particular base pair can shift from Watson-Crick to Hoogstein base pairing. The Watson-Crick configuration is more stable, so a given base pair will spend only a small fraction of the time in the Hoogstein configuration. But Hoogstein base pairs do exist in solution, as measured by NMR spectroscopy. Because of the degrees of freedom in the sugar phosphate backbone, neighboring base pairs and bases within a base pair can vary in their positions relative to each other. As shown here, scientists have given names to the different ways in which the bases can rotate or translate relative to each other. You do not have to memorize all these names, I'm just showing them to help you think about possible structural variation within and between base pairs. The main terms that we'll look at in this course are circled. Twist is just how much rotation there is between base pairs as you move along the helix. Roll and slide are rotation around or translation along the long axis of the base pair. And I'll describe propeller twist in a moment. But first I want to make the point that changing one of these parameters is almost certain to affect one or more of the others. For example, you can imagine taking a dinucleotide, like we see in the upper part of this diagram, and sliding the top base pair to the right. Clearly, this changes the slide. But it also changes the rotation along the helical axis, or twist, between the two base pairs. The twist has decreased from 36 degrees in the top diagram to 28 degrees on the bottom. 
So the parameters on this chart are interdependent, such that changing one has a ripple effect on others. Now I want to explain what propeller twist is and why it happens. Remember that a major driving force for formation of a double helix is the favorability of hiding hydrophobic surfaces of the nitrogenous bases from water. To get the surfaces of the bases to touch each other, you have to introduce a twist into the system. But you can see that this does not completely hide all parts of the hydrophobic surface. There is a small area here that is not covered. To try to hide even more of the surface, the bases rotate along an axis perpendicular to the helical axis and parallel to the long axis of the base pair. I'll try to show this on the right. So imagine looking at a double helix from the side through the sugar phosphate backbone in a direction parallel to the hydrogen bonds between the bases. The pink and blue rectangles represent what you would see, the edges of two neighboring bases on the same strand. Their base pairing partners are not shown but are behind these rectangles. In the diagram, the bases overlap in one area, but in other areas the surfaces are exposed to water. The exposed area can be reduced if the bases both rotate clockwise around the axis that goes through the base pair. If the bases rotated counterclockwise, it would make the situation worse. The same thing happens on both strands, but because of the way the bases rotate, the two bases in a base pair end up not being in the same plane. The hydrogen bonds are strained a bit to allow the bases to rotate. In each base pair, you end up with a propeller-like structure in which the two parts are rotated relative to each other. Here is another diagram that tries to show this phenomenon. The diagram on the left has no propeller twist, and the diagram on the right has propeller twist added. Propeller twist happens to some degree to most, if not all, base pairs in a double helix. The specific sequence of a dinucleotide can influence how much propeller twist happens. For example, in the AATT dinucleotide, it is possible for a hydrogen bond to form between adenine of one base pair and the thymine of the next base pair. This hydrogen bond is made stronger if propeller twist is larger than usual. So you will generally see more propeller twist in AATT dinucleotides than in other combinations. The impact of sequence extends to other parameters as well. For example, if you have a purine and a pyrimidine next to each other on the same strand, propeller twist will cause a steric clash between the two purines at the star. To avoid this, the bases can either slide one way, so that the purines don't touch each other, or they can slide the other way, so that the purines overlap more substantially. In the first case, the bases on the same strand will remain parallel to each other, and roll equals zero. But in the second case, because of propeller twist, the bases on the same strand will not be parallel to each other and roll will be introduced. You don't need to remember specific details presented on this slide, but I hope you will take away general ideas about how specific interactions between bases can cause changes in parameters such as propeller twist, slide, and roll. In the next video, I'll continue talking about flexibility in DNA structures.